Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Howdy. How's everybody doing? It's good to uh, actually see faces and not a Zoom screen for the first time in I don't know how long. Uh, I know this is the only the second time I've played in front of human beings in the last year and a half. Uh, I think because last week we had a chance to play at the DC Jazz Festival, so that was real people and not a screen, um, and then tonight. But before that, it was us by ourselves and hoping somebody was maybe in the bathroom watching. <laughs> uh, you know, it's been a lot of been a lot of business up top, athletic shorts and whatever, and flip flops and Lululemon pants on the bottom. So, <laughs> hopefully, uh, we can do these kind of things much more often. So, uh, I'd like to take the time to introduce the band uh, and also what we play. So, the first song, of course, was the great jazz standard, uh, "Night and Day," which actually uh, that arrangement was from the record El Gaucho which was the first time I had the chance to record with Steven back in 2007, a very long time ago. Uh, and then the second one was Milestones. That, was that on that one too? That was on that record too. So uh, with Jason was on that record and then the great Neil Kane, uh, bassist for Harry Connor Dream was on that. So uh, let me go in order of how long I've known the people and we'll introduce it that way. So I just met Kevin yesterday, no. <laughs> So Kevin's a phenomenal up and coming young bassist uh, uh, that I, when did I meet you? Did you used to go to Shed? Yeah. That's oh, okay. So I used to run a jam session a few years back where I would abuse the younger students that came through, um, give them dirty looks and all kinds of things. And Kevin was one of those brave enough to uh, come out and play. And so now uh, he's part of my, my trio and in the last couple of years, we actually went to D.C. and won the D.C. Jazz Prix and done some other concerts and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's wonderful to have him in the band, Mr. Kevin Beardsley on the bass. <laughs> <coughs> so I've known Stephen the second longest, but it's such a huge gap. I think I've known Stephen about as long as you were. How old are you? 24. Good gracious, this, oh, I'm just a babe. See, whole life is in front of you, 24. Uh, so I met, uh, I met Steven, I, I, I'm from North Carolina, and when I decided to go to uh, undergrad school, I went to school in New Orleans. And so I was there about six years, yes, yes, New Orleans, great place. I, I was down there about six years, and then Hurricane Katrina hit. And so I came back home, and I thought I was just gonna be here for a few months. That was 05, I'm still here, so, um, but, I, I do believe uh, Steve was one of the things that reminded me that God does not make mistakes um, because because <laughs> I was I was very looking especially looking back I I was not in a great place when I left New Orleans I was very unhappy I was living in Greenville North Carolina the hub of jazz in the world <laughs> so I'm so I'm. I'm going through my woe is me moment, and I'm thinking, how could I live in New Orleans, and now I'm living in Greenville, North Carolina, of all places. Uh, and so I, some of the students were like, oh, you got to hear this saxophone is Stephen Riley. And of course, in my head, I'm like, we're in Greenville. This guy's probably trash, just <laughs> god awful. And so we walk into the place where they're doing the gig, and whomever's playing, I'm like, oh, they're playing a CD, because that can't be somebody here. And I walk in and Steve's playing. I'm like, okay, this is very, very odd. And so we hit it off immediately. I think maybe like we exchanged numbers and then maybe the next night we went into the practice rooms and just played for hours. Um, and so we've been, I guess, uh, we've been uh, musical companions and friends and talked to each other off, you know, career ledges, you know, late into the night. Uh, many times had adventures driving from Toronto in a snowstorm in the middle of the night. Um, so very happy to have not only met him at that time, but to have a chance to record several times with him, which there are CDs. We did a duo record. I will talk about that later, but they are for sale. Um, 
But yeah, a good friend, great musical colleague, Mr. Stephen Riley on the saxophone. <laughs> Um, obviously, if you guys know anything about jazz, you know who is playing drums, so I won't bore you with his list of accomplishments. I'll just share some personal tidbits. Uh, I think I first played a gig with you with Daryl Reeves. And so Daryl Reeves was a, was a great saxophonist from Atlanta, living in New Orleans when I got down there. And he would call all kinds of tunes that I didn't know anything about. I I was wet behind his. I, I thought coming from North Carolina, I had made some all district bands. I was like, oh, I can play. And then I got to New Orleans. I was like, I can't play. This isn't. Uh, and so we played the Impaler. And so there's this part in the Impaler where it's like, uh, it goes to seven. And I could barely play in four at the time, let alone odd meters. Uh, but I just remember doing that gig with Jason, and I was, I was scared to death. Because I had heard stories, people were like, oh, watch out, he's going to throw you off. He's going to come in on beat two and make you think it's beat one and all these kind of things. And what I remember uh, after playing with him was not only how encouraging he was, but how he never let me get lost. And so that was something that always stuck with me, how he could have easily just been like, oh, you're gone. You're, and just kind of let me just drown. But he would always do something like, a eh, bridge. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's been an honor knowing him. Um, I, I got a chance not only to play with him then, but when I used to play with his brother Delphio, which that's a, some therapy sessions I should probably go to for doing that gig. But uh, I did a lot of gigs with him doing that and then the chance to record with him, because uh, I know him and Steven and Neil had already recorded several times, so I was just happy to be part of the number. So I'm just, you know, over the moon that I could have him on one of my gigs. So the wonderful, the great Mr. Jason Marsalis on the drums. <laughs> so we're going to play a ballad now. Uh, one made, I guess made most famous by Coleman Hawkins and John Coltrane, although two very different versions. Uh, but this is body and soul. Thank you. 
Thank you, body and soul. So we're going to do another tune that we, I can't believe it was that long ago. It was 14, 15 years ago that uh, we recorded this. But uh, Last time I played it, too. <laughs> <laughs> so this, um, typically when you hear this tune uh, that was made famous by uh, Mr. John Coltrane, when you hear this, it's usually done as a ballad, but we, uh, Steve had the idea to do it as kind of a waltz, and I think it turned out not terrible, right? I guess that's all you can ask for, is just, just not terrible. It was, we, it, could, it could have been worse, right? So yeah, this is uh, Central Park West. Thank you. 
So now is the time that I must uh, tell you about our CDs. They're security at the front door. You cannot exit. It's not, these are not my rules. I am just a messenger. I was told you cannot leave without purchasing, I think it's 10 CDs each. <laughs> Again, not my rules. When in Rome, you have to, so how much are, how much are you selling them for? So here's the special. <laughs> One for 20, two for 40. <laughs> and if you get three, 60 for you. <laughs> so we like to make deals here. I think that's a that's 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 a bargain. You're striking a. We don't give those kind of deep discounts everywhere. Only here in Durham. <laughs> so yeah, that's actually um, original mine. It's a recording uh, me and Stephen did. It's a duo recording on Cellar Live Records. Um, I mean, me and him have been playing so long that doing a duo record just seemed kind of overdue. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to do. We uh, traveled up to Vancouver, played a couple concerts, and then recorded. Um, and it was one of those because the travel, the return travel was so hectic, I think both of us didn't even really listen to it and kind of dismissed it like, eh. Um, and then I think I went back maybe about six months later and listened to it, then I texted him, I said, we've got something here. Because I think both of us listening, that's because you should never, as a musician, if there are any young musicians out there, as soon as you record, don't go back and listen to it like right away. Because it's always going to be, you're going to think it's really, really good or really, really bad. You're not going to hear it like exactly for what it is. So I think uh, we were just like, this is kind of terrible. 
And because uh, I think he even we even talked about maybe re-recording it. Um, but I guess when we had fresh ears a few months later, then went back. It's like, oh, this is some some nice stuff. So these nice things can be yours <laughs> for the low low price of one for twenty, two for forty, or three for sixty. They can be yours. You can take us home with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and also, I brought a few of mine. But at first, I wasn't going to bring, because I was like, you know what? There's no way that people that come to Sharp Nine don't have the record I released in 2018. There's no way <laughs> that's possible. But just in case there's somebody who still hasn't bought My Americana, there's the same special for My Americana. So. So yeah, there's both my trio CD from a few years back available for sale and the duo one. So uh, I think you'll enjoy, I think you should buy both. Me personally, I think you should buy both and buy multiple copies of both <laughs> and then gift them to friends and family at Christmas. Or if you don't like it, give it to people you don't like at Christmas. <laughs> you can say, hey, I think you'll love this CD. Here, have it. You know, to maybe a in-law you don't like or something like that. So, all right, so let's do, I think we're going to do uh, a little mashup. Uh, Thelonious Monk wrote a tune called Evidence, but it was based on the tune Just You, Just Me. And Monk being the quirky person that he was, so Just You, Just Me is what? It's just us. And you take just us, you put it together justice, and from that, he got evidence. So I don't know how. I, I don't know. I tell it. <laughs> Somebody told me. Yeah, I was about to say, I should ask, is this true, Jason? Yes or no? You know what? There is a, I think there is a tune that is called Justice. So, yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like I'm sort of telling the truth. Because, I mean, this would happen. I remember doing gigs in New Orleans. If Jason was on the gig and you needed a fact check, whether it was when something was recorded, who, I mean, it could be who was setting the thermostat that day at the studio, Jason can tell you all those things. So if he says it's half true, I feel confident telling my story and I will continue to tell it. So Thelonious Monk got evidence from just you, just me. So yeah, we're gonna do a little bit of that. Uh, so yeah, just you, just me.
Thank you. So it's uh, we have uh, we have arrived at that time of the evening where we must say goodbye, but we have one more for you. Uh, and I thought it would be fitting, since I had Jason travel all this way, uh, if we paid tribute with the final song uh, to the great Ellis Marsalis and played one of his compositions. Um, I, I didn't have the pleasure of studying directly with him, but with playing with Delphio, I was taken by the house several times to be admonished for um, something that Delphio found that I wasn't doing correctly. So that was always like, me and him would argue. He was like, well, we're just gonna go ask Ellis. <laughs> um, and so I think it was one time we played, you don't know what love is. And whatever intro I played, he just stared at me on stage while I played it with this look of dis disdain. <laughs> and so he was like, that was, that was terrible. I was like, I thought it was pretty good. And so he was like, we're going to go ask Ellis. So he took me to uh, Mr. Marcellus's house. I sat down and I played. He's like, oh, sounds fine to me. Now, I don't know if it's because I actually sounded OK or if he wanted to spite Delphio. I don't know which it was. <laughs> um, but I also remember uh, a time where Delphio told me to learn a song. It was uh, I Thought About You. It was at a gig one week. So we come to the gig the, the next week. He's like, all right, let's play I Thought About You. And I'm doing this on stage, like not trying to make a scene, but just like, no, I don't. And so he would, he was just like, he spoke, he was on the mic, he was like, uh, what's that? He never called me by my first name. Delphi would always say Turner. He said, what's that, Turner? I was like, mm, mm, mm. And so Ellis was in the audience. He's like, oh, okay, you don't know it? He's like, I dare come up here. So I get up to leave the stage. He's like, no, stand beside the piano and watch. <laughs> so like a child, I sat there. But what I got was one of the most tasteful uh, and most gorgeous renditions of I Thought About You that, that could be played. So the one thing I always noticed when I would go watch his gig at Snug, which he had a weekly gig, was he always seemed to know what was right to play. Like it was never, it was almost like the three bears. It was never too much, never too little. And me and Jason were talking earlier just about how musicians of that time, they had to play so many different styles of music and so much that they always knew what was called for. And so I thought, let's, let's do, and this is one of the first compositions I learned when I got to New Orleans. It was one of those that when you went to a jam session and they called Swinging at the Haven, and they're like, how do you not know that you live in, in New Orleans? I'm like, I'm not from, New I'm from North Carolina. I was like, we can play, I don't know. What's a North Carolina song? Sweet I, Home Alabama. I don't know. Sweet Home Alabama is not a North <laughs> Carolina song. <laughs> Where are you from? Now, there's some parts of North Carolina. Oh, yeah, he's from Greenville. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of other other songs that uh, they probably play out there and certain flags they wave out there too that uh, we could play Dixie. I mean, I think that'd be fitting, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Swinging at the Haven was one of the first selections I had to learn um, about the great Ellis Marsalis. So I thought it'd be fitting we'll close um, with this uh, great standard uh, by a great man, great teacher, great composer, great, um, great pianist. So. Uh, he truly will be missed. I know uh, I, I learned a lion's share just by being in his, in his sphere, not even having going. I don't even think I need to go to lessons. It was just, and I think that's a little old school where it's just like, you don't need a lesson. Just go sit, sit and be quiet and watch. Um, and I know I got a chance several times where he would see me. I remember the, it's things like this because being a musician is hard. It's one of the things that people don't tell you about in school, or it's, it's exhausting, it's difficult. There's many times where you're like, I don't think this is for me. Maybe I should just become a lawyer. Or, but I remember once uh, he was playing at Snug, and I was upstairs just watching. And in the middle of a song, he got up and came upstairs and asked me, did I want to play? And I, so in my mind, I'm like, first, how did he know I was here? But he took, and it's not only he knew I was here, he came up in the middle of the song and was like, go play one. So it's those kind of things when you're 20, 21, 
and you're like, I don't know. Well, you're like, oh, maybe, maybe I can, you know, do this another year before I have to get a real job. Maybe I can. So, yeah, I, I was blessed to be in New Orleans and be in his presence and have, you know, a few conversations with him, and, but just most important, just to watch him play. Um, so here's Swinging at the Haven, Kevin Beardsley on bass. Stephen Riley on the saxophone, Stephen Riley. And please, a large round of applause for Mr. Jason Marsalis on the drums. It's been, it's been a pleasure playing for you, playing for humans, and actually seeing faces and all that good stuff. So here you go, swinging at the Avon.
Thank you, Stephen Riley, Jason Marsalis, Kevin Beersley. Thank you. Good night.